It's Coast to Coast AM. Hello there. Connie Willis here. All right, you, uh, you know, Super Bowl fans coming up. We got, we got, we got the teams. We've got the teams, 49ers and the Chiefs. It was fun watching the games today. And yeah, I was thinking, man, you know, not, I didn't really have anybody in mind to win, but I was glad uh, San Francisco did. But at first I was like, oh man, they're just, it's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And then boom, they came up from behind. So that was great to watch that. It's, it's just always fun to watch a good game, whether you're, you know, just want a good game. You don't want a snooze game, right? You just want a good game. And, and the games today were really good. So let's hope that the Super Bowl is as well. You know, that sometimes that, can also be where it's just so anyway looking for a good ball game and that'll be february 11th super bowl 58 looking forward to that it's always fun now i'm a cowboys fan and a broncos fan and even a dolphins fan and i guess there's some other ones i can you know hang into but i'm going to be going for the uh i'm going to go for san francisco so let's see what happens yeah i'm going to predict by three by three. I hope I remember that. I hope somebody will remember that. I'm sure I'll, I'll get a phone call on that one or some emails on that one. By the way, thanks so much for all your nice emails. Oh my goodness. You guys are very kind to me, very kind. And I really thank you for that. It's nice to get letters from you guys and it's very nice. So kindly, thank you very much. One of my friends, and he is a, a, an award winning Filmmaker is with us next here, William Gazetki, a documentarian. He is going to be describing his heritage of extraterrestrial contact. He likes to call it being met, which I find is very interesting too. Uh, well, uh, and, and he's got this amazing background with some amazing people. He's been able to work with the Doors, Bette Midler, Joe Cocker. <laughs> remember, remember when? Um, uh, oh my gosh, John, 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 John was. Belushi, John, John Belushi would, uh, he would imitate Joe Cocker and he nailed it. He was a better Joe Cocker than Joe Cocker. That was some good stuff, but let's bring back, uh, William Gazetki. Let's bring William. Have you ever been on coast to coast before? I have. Hi, Connie. You yes, have. I have twice. As a matter of fact, was it with me? Yes. It wasn't. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, I've, I've, I, I'm, I'm, if I hadn't looked it up, I wouldn't have remembered myself. Okay, good. I've, yeah. I've lost it. I've already lost it. It is so good to have you back on again then. And, Thanks. you know, because we've talked many other times before. We were talking about doing a documentary together. And that's how I first met you. And man, you know, I was so excited about that because you as a documentarian, let me tell you, this is, you know, this is, uh, I have a film background you've actually been able to do all these things like, like you do. And I was so excited when I met you because we were going to like follow me with what I know and that's what you do, but you got it. You understood it. You understood that, Hey, okay, we're going to research here and who knows what's going to happen. You know, as a documentarian in this field of research, that you don't know what's going to happen, where in a lot of documentaries, they have a good idea what's going to happen next. It's all scripted out, this and that. You understood who knows what's going to happen when we go to a location. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. And I, I appreciate what you're saying. It's very true. Uh, good documentary filmmaking is spontaneous, uh, and we have to deal with things that we, we have no idea what's going to happen. Yeah. We have no idea what's going to be next. And that's really what makes it a, you know, a, a real art. Uh, and well, and I fun. I appreciate your knowledge. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's that because when, when people, especially in this field, uh, that are that want to shoot something, they already have a plan of attack, and they will do everything they can to force it to make know, that fit. I know, but our audience know. knows better. That's not the way to do it. Yeah. That's and our audience way. knows better, and they're the ones <laughs> that are going to buy the film. <laughs> that's right. You know, that's exactly right. By the way, and that is proven to be true in my uh, world repeatedly is that authenticity and whatever that, whatever creates that, because you know, what's real is real and audiences, they know it, they feel it in their gut. They feel it in their heart. Yep. Um, and that, you know, it's, it's sustained. I mean, I'm very proud of the fact that my films are still viewable and watchable, you know, after many years of being out there, they're still, they still play well. Um, and I think that's because they are, they have, you know, real content to them. Yep. 
Yeah. And and just like Coast to Coast, we're all about it's storytelling. And I don't mean yeah. story as in making up lies. You know, these are encounters and experiences and people are, you know, it's the storytelling yeah. Yeah. word that works with that. And it stands yeah. the test of time. Because it's just like telling, you know, ghost stories around the campfire. They just stand the test of time. And it's just a wonderful place to be here on Coast to Coast. And it's one of the most ancient ways of sharing is to tell the story, the tale, um, which I hope, you know, we can talk about a few things tonight that are um, unusual and interesting uh, and insightful events and uh, heritages in my own world. I know. I can't that I hope wait. to, you know, I hope to, to get across tonight. So yeah. Well, tell everybody a little bit more about yourself. I mean, you've you've worked with some great names, and because of your background, and then you know what you have encountered as well with some of the uh, the content that you've come across. I think right. all of that matters from from the past and to now. So tell us a little bit more about your background. Well, it's interesting, you know. I mean, I think that part of what I want to share about tonight is what we call the paranormal. Um, and these are parts of the world, parts of life, parts of the universe that fall outside of our ordinary everyday reality. The, 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 the world that we are used to and the world that we're comfortable in and the world that we live in 99% of the time. And I've come to really accept and understand that these things that are out of the ordinary, that are unusual and different, and or you could call them paranormal, are important. Um, and they're important for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is that the experiences stick. I mean, I can remember feelings and events that have occurred in my life and other things that I'm aware of that I'll never forget. Um, I read recently uh, something about how when you have a paranormal experience, the reason it's so memorable is because the paranormal thing is working at it. You know, those things don't just happen on their own. It takes an energy. It takes an, a focus for something in the paranormal world to pop its head up in our lives and make itself heard or make itself known. And that's why we're impacted is because it's real, it's authentic, and it has a very deeper uh, level of meaning to it than just uh, an ordinary occurrence like crossing the street or, you know, having dinner. Um, so I just wanted to say something about that because I don't consider these things to be entertainment. Uh, I don't consider them to be idle experiences that I can just write my diary about um, if I had a diary. But uh, these are things that I uh, hold precious uh, to myself and that I share because I feel there's value. In, in sharing what what you know what I have to say. So do you um, do you think that everybody has these events, but some of us recognize them and some of us don't? Well, I think that's a great question, by the way. And I think dreaming is the first thing that comes to mind. You know, dreaming is a very uh, uh, common uh, occurrence that occurs in the very mysterious ways within the brain and within the mind. Um, they're still trying to figure out you know where they all come from. People have precognitive dreams. They predict things in, in the future. Um, sometimes their ancestors visit them in their dreams. So dreaming in itself, I think, is one of our main doorways into uh, the ordinary states of, of, uh, of everyday paranormal reality. Now, when we're awake and when we're conscious uh, and when something happens within our you know, conscious mind while we're, while we're awake, I think that's a little different. I think that's something that we have a deeper role in. Um, I know for myself and my own heritage with some of this, it goes back to my birth and before my birth. It goes back to my very early days of my family. Um, and so these are things that have been around me. Uh, you know, I was born in Tacoma, Washington. And Tacoma, Washington is a beautiful town. Um, and it's near this wonderful mountain called Mount Rainier. And Mount Rainier is kind of like Mount Shasta. It's this gorgeous, snow-covered, single mountain by itself. It's not a part of a range. It's just a great big mountain sitting there. Well, Mount Rainier is where uh, Kenneth Arnold, the, uh, Idaho, the uh, uh, yeah, Idaho pilot, first discovered and, and observed the, what has become to be known as the flying saucer. Um, he was flying his plane around Mount Rainier, Mount Rainier, 
and in 1947 and saw these uh, silvery, shiny, uh, um, flying craft in formation flying around the mountain. And he went to investigate them in his plane by himself uh, and got pretty close to him and was, you know, very uh, struck and impressed by something he nobody had ever seen before. This is a, you know, first time ever. And when he landed, he got a hold of the press and gave them an interview, and they asked him to describe what he saw. And he said, well, I saw these silvery objects, and they were, you know, they were kind of like, you know, like a cup and a saucer. You know, it was kind of like a flying saucer. And he's the guy that made the term, made up the term flying saucer mm. near Tacoma, Washington, where I was born. So, mm. you know, it's kind of in the neighborhood, if you, if you, if you will. Isn't, um, isn't, and, um, <laughs> isn't, no, that's great. No, I love it. Isn't, um, uh, I'm going to sound really dumb here, so forgive me, but okay. So Mount St. Helens, it yeah. erupted. That's a volcano. So you're saying right. Rainier mountain, but volcano. No volcano. What? Not, well, not, okay. not, not in our, our memory. You know, I don't know if we ever had a volcano or not. But, no, Mount Rainier is, a, is again, a standalone mountain. Kind of reminds me of the mountain from uh, The Hobbit. Uh, oh, you know, yeah, the, yeah. Right? Yeah. It's that kind of thing. Great big yeah. stamp, beautiful mountain. Um, Snow-covered uh, and visible from Tacoma is the perfect vantage point to look at the mountain. Uh, my grandmother was in Tacoma her most of her life, and she always had a place where she could see the mountain. And that's what people call it. They call it the mountain. The mountain. Um, that's that's so interesting. The, yeah, yeah, it's interesting that you put it that way. I've not thought about it that way. You're like, it's a mountain. There's no other mountains around. There's no range. I'm, you know, get to enjoy the uh, Colorado Rockies, and it's just mountain, 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 and it's just beautiful and layers of them, and yeah. and I, I love that, and you're right. That's just standalone mountain, which is very odd and strange things around it and lots of history <laughs> behind it of <and> stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you know, why these UFOs, as we call them now, why these disc-shaped craft were even there is well, – I don't know what the – I don't know what the, that part of the story is. Um, mm. So, again, uh, um, um, uh, Arnold, uh, you know, just – he – I don't know what – again, was it an accident that he stumbled across this, or was there something in his destiny and his fate? Because it certainly changed not only his entire life, but the entire Northwest became sort of a mecca of interest in this kind of thing. And there are other stories of things that occurred in the Northwest in the ensuing years as well. Oh, my goodness. I think I need to grab a mic and you need to grab your camera and we both head up there and just <laughs> see what happens. I think that would be a blast. That would be a blast and you know it would. <laughs> that would be so much fun. Okay, so I want to go back into uh, more of the area of – uh, some of your other expertise where you were, I just think this is important. I'm not sure why, and maybe you can nail it, but you did the, you know, Emmy award winning post-production sound mixer for motion right. pictures and television. You did right. these things and yeah. worked with the doors, Bette Midler, Joe Cocker. I'm sure there's some other names that you can throw out, but to me, you know, cause I've, I've been in audio a lot with radio. It's very audio oriented and, you know, right. and then you go and produce right. commercials and voice work and things like that. And you're constantly listening and, and you're constantly producing cause we're live, right? So we're always producing and other people that are producing the shows with us and it's all happening. So, uh, and when I was working in films, you know, and, and TV, you know, it's great. The audio guys, I always love the audio people because we're all pretty cool. It's just the way it is, but there's <laughs> something right. But there's something else special about people in the audio world, because I guess, because you're always really, you got the headphones on, you're always listening intently. There better not be a little cricket sound. There better not be a pencil yeah. drop, yeah. nothing. And I think that matters in the world of paranormal and the things that are strange. Well, that's a very good analogy, Connie. And I, I just want to say that, um, I, first of all, I love being a sound mixer. I just, you know, I could not have been more enthusiastic about my career path. <clears throat> and I got into it when I was young. Uh, through the typical adolescent interest, I became a lover of music. And as soon as I became a lover of music, I started realizing more about the recording technology. 
And I got very involved in the recording console. I built a recording console when I was 22, mm. um, which is still in service in Los Angeles. Cool. And uh, yeah, and uh, it took me three years to do. But uh, I loved what was underneath the knobs, what was inside. Um, and as I moved along through my career, I started mixing in film and television. Uh, things just took – just a natural progression. I did music for about six years, and then I got into film and television. I had a great time. Show Street Blues and St. Elsewhere and Moonlighting and In the Heat of the Night. One-hour dramas was what I specialized in. But uh, I can remember being in the what they call the dubbing stage or the mixing stage uh, for uh, sounds for film. And it was all men, first of all, all men, all men mixing, all men in the back room. There wasn't a woman to be seen, all male projectionists, uh, <laughs> back when we were on film. There wasn't a woman to be seen anywhere other than the cafeteria. And we didn't even give it a second thought. I mean, that's just the way it had been since the 30s. You know, it just wasn't, I mean, things didn't, things did eventually change. Uh, Anna Belmer, by the way, is one of the most well-known female mixers. And uh, she is one of the people that helped change the entire culture of sound for film. But anyway, I can remember sitting there on the dubbing stage next to this guy, Bill Nicholson, who was tough as nails. This guy, he worked with um, uh, Scorsese on Raging Bull, doing sound effects. I mean, this guy mm -hmm. was one tough cookie. And, you know, I was a young kind of upstart rock and roll guy, you know, and uh, it took us a while to, to, to get comfortable with each other. But I can remember sitting there on that stage going, you know, all these tough guys, and we're all so sensitive. We're all so sensitive. We can hear, just like you said, we can hear a pin drop. We can hear a cricket. We can hear yeah. you know, something way off in the distance or way in the left or the right. And I was, I look at this guy, Bill, and I just thought to myself, you son of a gun. Here you are, toughest guy, tough as nails. And because you got to handle all the producers and directors who are standing behind you trying to tell you what to do. Um, and at the same time, you have to be so sensitive and so like just like a little a little baby. And we'll talk more about that when we come back because you're exactly right. William Gazeki with me. Connie Willis here. You're listening to Coast to Coast AM. It is Coast to Coast AM. Hi there. How are you? Connie Willis here. Hope you enjoyed all the ball games today. And I uh, hope you're still with me here. If not, don't worry. You can become a Coast Insider. All is good that way. If you'd like to find me outside of here, go to ConnieWillis.com. I have a couple different shows. Connie After Dark is a live virtual bar where you can have a drink with me or not. It's up to you, but we have a really good time. And what happens there stays there. And you'll know what I mean if you go and, and if you join it. The other one is Blue Rock Talk where you, um, you know, it's Earth's most interesting conversations and we go on live investigations, Project Creepy Hotspot. In fact, we're going to be heading uh, to one here in the next couple of, I guess, not next week or the next couple of weeks. I don't have my calendar right in front of me, but, yep, we either do hauntings or search, uh, do an investigations with Bigfoot, Strange Lights, Dog Man, different things like that. A lot of fun. The real deal. This is not 101 stuff. This isn't boring terrible it's it you all it's the real deal we've had 100 percent activity all the way across the board with the show woohoo there's reasons why so join us and if you've never done anything like that well you can actually investigate live virtually and learn a whole lot so that's at connie sign up for one of my shows definitely sign up for the newsletter i would appreciate that okay our guest tonight william gazetki you can find him and learn more about him at william i'll spell his last name for you so you got the william part right gazetki is g-a-z-e-c-k-i g-a-z-e-c-k-i.com and you can go to our website as well and you can find that and click on it and that's where you can learn a whole lot more about him. He's got uh, different documentaries out there. One of the ones that we'll mention here for sure is Crop Circles, the movie. So you can also go to CropCirclesTheMovie.com and learn more about that. But I think just even going to William Gazeki, you'll you'll nail it all. Uh, but why I wanted to bring that up is it's a it's a great film to watch. And William also has an update 
on the crop circles. So crop circles, the movie, it's a great movie. William did a great job on it. It is so interesting. You know, some of these films that people put together with this can be, you know, not so, you know, not so exciting. Yours is really just loaded full of information and just learned a lot, learned a lot, but I imagine you did too. Oh yeah. It's, uh, you know, the crop soil phenomenon has been a part of my life since the mid nineties. So it's been it's been quite some time. And there's a relationship there. You know, there is a I, I hesitate to call it a friendship, but there is a connection that uh is around uh you know, around has been around me for a long time. Um and I wanted to share about my uh my first crop circle experience, which I've never shared before. It's gonna open my new film. I'm doing a follow-up film on the crop circles, uh, oh, and it's excellent. going to be a little bit different than the previous one in that it's going to include a lot of the early days when nobody questioned whether they were made by people or not, because that's a big mm-hmm. issue now. Oh, there's people with stomper boards and ropes, and they make all these things in the fields in England. Well, in the early days, nobody ever even talked about that. It wasn't even brought up as, as a subject. People knew from what they saw and what they experienced that this was an unusual phenomena, that this is a unique paranormal phenomena. And you know what? I appreciate you saying that because, William, I got to tell you, you know, a, a, a friend of the family is very smart, intelligent man. And he, he will ask me about all these different things that we talk about. And at one point he mentioned the crop circles and it, it's not, you know, watching your film and then talking to people that have been into the same areas that have seen the, the yeah. ones you have. Then then, you know, it's not, you know, no, no, this is something special. But he had said to me, oh, yeah, they proved that with those guys and the stuff stompers and the rope. And I looked at him. He literally believed that was the answer because it was posted somewhere where here's the answer. And and then it made at least this person, which I know he represents a lot more, that actually believed that that's it. It's over. There, there's the answer. Not at all. No, not at well, all. That's, that's the easy way out, first of all. Yeah. You yeah. Know, it's the most, most convenient, easiest, quote unquote, logical uh, way to interpret these things. And they're, you know, I got to say, this is not uh, the easiest material in the world to just integrate. It does take effort. It does take insight. It does take an open mind. Um, and then there's plenty of evidence. There's plenty of evidence that, that demonstrates that the crop circle phenomena as a whole is not entirely man-made. That's, a, that's a, just a stone-cold fact. Even the people that make them will tell you that that's the case. Um, and what do you why, think they are? Them, why people make them and all that is a whole nother strange. Yeah. That's a whole nother film. Yeah. Well, it's, I don't understand, but I, I've never been a big proponent of it. Although I got to say that from what I can tell these people who have been making them and they work hard at it, they work hard at it. They've been working at it for years. They do. They themselves are growing from being around this. You know, the, hmm. the, actual, the real circle makers are not, you know, uh, inert. They know what these people are doing. They're there. I mean, the people that make them say that things happen while they're making them that they can't explain. So they have their own world going on with the actual phenomena that they're imitating. (laughs) Interesting. Oh, yeah. It's it's very interesting. Well, tell Um, us about what, what what you experience. Well, I first came, encountered all of this in the mid-90s, when a group of um, uh, British professionals, middle-aged British professionals, went on tour around the United States giving lectures on the crop circle phenomena. Uh, and in those days, the formations were these long, what they call pictograms, and they were these long, two, three hundred yards long, uh, in the middle of a, of a field of wheat, uh, all these different diagrammatic uh, sections. And they were giving lectures. I was fascinated. I just thought, because they were very convincing. I mean, these these were professionals. These were these were not you know a bunch of pot smoking hippies. These were uh, uh, people that had you know executive level employment. Uh, uh, you know, they they were mature men, and they were very serious about conveying their uh, knowledge of what they were experiencing over in England. So that got me involved, and then get to the end of the 1990s, and one thing led to another, and I got to know a gentleman by the name of Michael Glickman. And Michael Glickman was a geometer. He was an architect who taught at UCLA, but he was also a geometer. He used to draw 
the formations and analyze the, um, the geometry, analyze the mathematics embedded. Because what people don't realize about crop circles is that they're not just images, they're also mathematical representations. They're very precisely designed and very precisely proportioned so that what you see isn't just an image, it's also a representation of a mathematical formula or more formula, more than one formula. Mm. And Michael was starting to deconstruct all this and, and, and teach people and learn himself how much was embedded in these uh, images. And so I went over uh, with a friend of his uh, and, and mine and uh, to visit him in England down in uh, the Wiltshire area, which is where they appear, uh, within a 50, 100-mile radius of Stonehenge. And we got there on a Friday night, and it came in from Heathrow, I drove down, uh, went to bed, and about 5 o'clock in the morning, I woke up. And for, for no particular reason, uh, and I'm not prone to waking up in the middle of the night, I woke up, and in the distance, I could hear farm animals. Uh, 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 upset. They were very upset. They were perturbed. Uh, horses and dogs and, you know, it was weird. It was like, what the heck's going on? It was, well, I didn't know there were farms in the area. See, so your like, audio background, just saying, just saying. Sensitive. <laughs> sensitive, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's very true. Yeah. Because I noticed it. I, I could hear the detail and I could tell that these animals were upset. There was something was going on. But I didn't. I knew nothing about anything, you know. Now I found out later what what probably what causes things like that, uh, which is the formation of a crop circle nearby. That's what gets the animals upset. Hmm. So anyway, we got up the next morning, had breakfast. Uh, Michael had a map of because it was late. It was in August, so it was late in the season. So there had been formations uh, coming down in the area within a few miles of where he lived. Um, and we took out a map and, and you know, pinpointed where, where we were going to drive. And we drove out the driveway and, and took a left down the lane and crossed this little bridge. And we come up uh, on this gentle rise uh, in the middle. It's all, uh, by the way, it's all farm fields around this area. It's all fields of wheat and barley. Uh, so we had, we had a little townhouse in the middle of basically a bunch of farmland. So it was not a, we were not in a town. We were not in a uh, neighborhood or a development area. It was one little place in the middle of a bunch of fields of wheat. And so we're driving up this little road. We went 100 yards away from his house. And look over to the right, there's a brand-new crop circle that mm. appeared that night. So within a stone's throw of where I was staying, within, within a stone's throw of Glickman's house, a crop circle appeared the night we arrived. And mm. that was a mind-blower. And we stopped the car. I got. I had a great big fifty-pound high def camera. I'd never traveled with a high def camera before, and uh, did my very first shoot uh, on wow. the very first crop circle I ever saw, which appeared the night I arrived in England. Wow! That's, that's the crop circle. I mean, that's they're talking to you. The playfulness and the and it was a small field. It's called Horton Two Thousand, by the way. It's what it's called. H O R T O N. Horton 2000, you can Google it, um, and it's just a, 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 a nice, oh, I don't know how, 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 uh, what the diameter is, but it's a nice circle laid down. Uh, oh, it was August 6, 2000. Thank you. Um, it's a circle with a ring around it, and then on the ring is a five-pointed star. Oh. Um, and I'll, you know, it, I'll have a picture of it all up on my wall the rest of my life. Yeah. That's, oh, that's my important. goodness. Yeah, that's it was really amazing. That's like it was for you. Like, hello, William. How are you? Kind of. Welcome. I mean, everybody thought it was for them. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course. There were three of us, were three of us who, were in the, who were there that night. And, uh, and I, you know, I don't know if I can say it was for me or not. I, uh, I must say that uh, as I was making that film, uh, some incredible things happened. Uh, in 2001, uh, the um, galactic spiral appeared. The galactic spiral in 2001 was the largest crop circle crop formation to ever appear anywhere. It was four football fields in size, mm. and uh, it was um, and it, it appeared while I was in the middle of making making the film, which I thought was just stunning. And uh, yeah, 
Uh, but anyway, so a few, few things like that happened while, while I was working that uh, I thought were just endearing for me uh, to this phenomena. And I, and I don't share much about this. The story I just told you, I don't think I've ever told anybody. Well, thank you. Uh, I, we appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. No, really. I mean, I meant that seriously. I wasn't being cocky. You know, what I just learned, too, is you're right. It, you know, you corrected yourself. You said crop circles. No, formation. You're right. There's circles. Then there's formations because yeah. they're not all circles. Some of these no, are just, not. I no. mean, unreal. Now, let me ask this. Do you think uh, that these things, through all your experience, because you, you've really got into this deep, but do yeah. you think something is being like stamped on top by something, drawn on top by something, or maybe something underneath is pulling something, you know, right. pulling it down? Right. From what we can tell, um, the, the plants are bent over uh, at, the, at the base. So you, you come up out of the, out of the uh, roots, you get to the lower part of the plant, and it's heated. Well, what, we, what we can tell is heated up. So it softens the, 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 the stock so the stock can be bent over. And so, every one of them, not one or two, every one of them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, <sighs> you know, that's why we call it magic. Uh, it's ridiculous. We who, are, we who are ignorant humans know nothing. Um, <laughs> but it appears, you know, and gravity seems to be possibly some sort of some form of gravity control that hmm. allows the plants to, to bend over. But the other thing is, and there's several factors in all this. One is the shapes themselves, the formations of them, you know, the, the design of them is so sophisticated. Yes. Precise. I mean, these yeah. things are bent over to the plant, right to the plant. You know, mm. there's no ambiguity about where the edge of a circle is. <laughs> uh, so, um, it's amazing. One of the, one of one of the key things about a genuine formation is how the plants are laid down because they're laid down in various kinds of swirls, counterclockwise, clockwise, uh, swirls under these swirls. There's all sorts of ways in which the plants are manipulated that could never be done with a board and a rope. It just can't be done. Yeah. Uh, and plus the fresh ones, the, the, you know, there are still people who get up at five o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, drive around Wiltshire looking for new formations. And that was always, when I was over there, that was always a real popular pastime was the few people that bothered to get up really early in the morning and drive around looking for these things. And one of the things about a new one is there's no footprint. There's no footprint, right. there's no sign of any kind of human presence at all. And the, the ones that are human made, they're all, the, the plants are all smashed down, everything's broken, you know, and it's obvious that they were made by, uh, in, in, in a, in a, um, somewhat violent manner, whereas the authentic ones are very gracefully, the plants are very gracefully laid down. Mm. So um, that's what makes it so much fun being over there, too, is actually being able to be inside of one, to go visit one. Uh, is How'd a, that feel? Did you pick up a vibe or anything? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's such a treat. You know what they say about crop circles is that if you're a ballerina, you get better at ballet, Right. And if you're a, you know, whatever, you get better at it. Well, I'm a Zen Buddhist. So what I experienced over there was a sense of Zen, mm. you know, a, sense, a sense of Zen that I recognized internally through my own practice. And uh, so it was a wonderful kind of, it's a delicious, elated, it's not extreme, but it's very uh, pleasant and positive. You know, there's nothing about the crop circles that's ever scary. That's, that's the other thing I like about it. You know, I mean, the UFO world can be terrifying. Really be scary. <laughs> yes. In many different ways. And for good reason. <laughs> On many levels, yes. Yeah. But the crop circles <laughs> are never scary. They're delightful. Mm. Um, and they're, they're fun to be around. The only, you know, this issue about whether they're human-made or man-made is a constant nuisance as far as I'm concerned. Yes. Um, but Agreed. I will say this, and if I haven't said it already. And that is that the people that are making them are themselves in touch with the real circle makers, you know, mm -hmm. so the actual intelligences that make the authentic ones are have contact and some kind of relationship with the humans that are imitating them and making the fake ones. That's interesting. So it's a big process. You know, it's, a, yeah. it's one big happy family. Yeah. Well, we got about a minute. So let me ask you this. What do you think? Is making them? Oh 
gosh, I've never heard that question before, Connie. <laughs> well, you got less than a minute now. <laughs> it's an interdimensional intelligence. So it's Say that again? It's an interdimensional intelligence. Okay. So it's, it's a real intelligence, just like, like we have brains and we have smarts, but it doesn't live in the world that we live in. It comes from its own world. And it comes here to put on a show, to give us a smile, to give us well, some sort of yes. I, well, they're, some... they're definitely communicating. Yes, There's no doubt in my mind that this is intentional communication for a reason, and and we can talk more about that. <laughs> I've never heard that question before, Connie. <laughs> Smart Alec. <laughs> I'll put it to you nicely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. William Gazeki is who we are talking to. You can find him at williamgazeki.com. And you can also go watch the movie that he's got, Crop Circles, the movie.com. I don't even know if we got your updated story yet, but we'll ask him when we come back. Time flies when you're on coast. No one ever believes me until they come on. They're like, oh my gosh, we're already done? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so next hour, um, we've got some more information to get, and we'll make sure we've got the update in because we heard a, a whole bunch of really great stuff. And that we can do a whole another show on that. But we also want to ask him about his uh, extraterrestrial lineage that he wants to talk about firsthand. So stay with me. Connie Willis here along with William Gazetke on Coast to Coast AM. <laughs> 